Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up later in the show, we'll look at the old South Central North Dakota homestead of Lawrence Wilk. But first, Matt O'Lean sits down with an author originally from Burundi. And my guest is Leticia Mizero Hellerud. She is the author of a new book, Being at Home in the World. It's a fascinating read about her travels uh, to the United States. And welcome to the show. Good to Thank see you. you. Good to see you, Matt. Uh, first off, tell folks a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're from originally. Well, I'm uh, originally from Burundi, and uh, which is a small landlocked country in the Great Lakes region of Africa. I uh, was born in Burundi and grew up uh, in Burundi, in France, in Burkina Faso, and in Rwanda before coming to United States. So I have been uh, a refugee in all those uh, countries at different stages of my life. When I came to United States in the fall of 1998, I was with uh, my three sisters, uh, my brother, and my all younger, and then uh, my then three-year-old son. Um, and we've lived in uh, this community, uh, Fargo-Moorhead, uh, ever since. I came through Lutheran Social Services, uh, the um, only recognized uh, resettlement agency in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Why write the book? What's the book about? Well, um, I, I had time. Let's put it that <laughs> way. I, did, I always knew that I had uh, uh, a book in me. I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to write about. I always knew that I didn't want to write an autobiography because I'm uh, very protective of my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, I didn't think that there would be anything interesting. Um, I wanted to tell my story in a way that it was more impactful. For example, highlighting uh, uh, the, the values and, uh, and um, the values uh, th that we connect us as uh, human beings. Um, I, I've, um, I wanted also to share about my journey of uh, stops and starts and ups and downs and, and, uh, and, and why, regardless of that, I chose to uh, keep uh, a positive outlook on life. Um, some of the things uh, that I uh, encountered in uh, my life uh, included, uh, of course, living in uh, four different countries uh, as a refugee and not necessarily thinking or dreaming about uh, tomorrow or a future. But it also involves, um, for instance, not uh, being able to say goodbye to a dying father and going through a divorce and raising uh, a children in a culture that's not my own, um, going through uh, uh, struggling with uh, well, weight-related insecurities and, and much more, um, like, uh, and recently being um, forced um, um, to, to resign or being fired from a job that I was so passionate about. So I wanted to write about all those ups and downs, but uh, still find um, like a way to tell a story, my story in an inspirational, uh, uplifting way uh, where anybody who is going through tough times uh, could find a reason to keep up uh, or to keep going. What was going on in Burundi when you left that forced you and your family to want to get out of there? Okay. So, as I said, I left four different times. Mm -hmm. So, the first two times, my parents made that decision because I was a child. The first time I was five, year, five years old, and it was in the 1970s. So, my parents decided that was probably the biggest crisis that we have had in Burundi. Um, we have two major ethnic groups, Hutus and Tutsis. Mm -hmm. My uh, father happens to be Hutu and my mother is Tutsi, so it adds some complexity to the equation. Uh, and, uh, and these two groups have not always uh, lived peacefully together and it's a much more complex and convol convoluted uh, uh, topic that we can uh, tackle in this limited scope. Uh, so. But with all those migrations, forced migrations, my uh, fleeing episodes, uh, the, um, the, the problems between Hutus and Tutsis were always at the core. Uh, so uh, the third time when I left that uh, I was a, a young uh, mother, 
myself. At that time I was a young mother and I didn't want to raise a child in the same environment I grew up, not knowing what's going to happen two years from now, a week from now, 10 years from now. So I, there is a point when you feel like I know how to live or to survive, but when you become a parent, um, there is added responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that made me really think um, about what kind of future I wanted to give my, my son or any other child that would be born after that. And, uh, and, and that was the, uh, the leap of faith that I wanted to take and start over, hopefully for good. Tell me about the people you met in Fargo that befriended you and how that adjustment was for you and your family. Um, Fargo was, uh, we didn't know what to expect when mm -hmm. we came to Fargo. We didn't even know about Fargo. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm glad we didn't, because I don't know if I, if I had had a choice. You know, I think I would have been scared because most people tend to emphasize the, the weather mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, downplay the people. So I'm glad you asked. So we, uh, I like to joke that Fargo um, chose us because we didn't know um, much about Fargo. But after 19 years uh, living in Fargo, I um, am very glad uh, to say that it became home. Uh, we met uh, friends who gave us more than what we, we really came here for. We wanted uh, shelter, safety, um, and a place where we could have opportunities and start over. But we found family and friends and the extended family that we left behind. So I, I, I can talk about Fargo all day long. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is no, um, it's hard to explain to my friends and my relatives who live in other parts of the country where the weather is much nicer, where the diversity is much more uh, pronounced. It's very hard for me to explain to them why I live in Fargo, but it's that welcome and, uh, and the friendship and uh, the smiles that we see uh, even um, when you cross a stranger. So uh, that's what Fargo community is about. But then also uh, deeper, I think most people in this community are interested in, uh, in new Americans uh, and they show by, uh, for example, there is still much work to do mm -hmm. when you think about institutions and employment and, and then promotions and all those kind of uh, things. But uh, in general, I think the Midwest and Fargo, Moorhead are very, very welcoming uh, communities. What do you make of the current kind of climate? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about refugee resettlement in this, in this city as well and nationally. What do you want people to know about that? Because it's kind of a hot button issue right now suddenly. Yes. Well, uh, first I'm glad that we are talking about it. I'm not always um, sure what to think about um, the negativity that uh, surrounds that topic. But I think it's important that we talk about the integration and we talk about the role of uh, the newcomers, like in terms of integration, what uh, to expect and, uh, and how to go about it. But it's also important that we talk about the role of uh, the mainstream communities. I like to give um, the analogy of a plant and the, and the soil. Um, so you can't ex expect that the seed will grow if the soil is not ready or, or, or in the right conditions. So I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's work that needs to be done by both the newcomers and the refugees and, and immigrants, uh, but also the mainstream communities. And so these dialogues, I think, should be focused on how do we integrate um, how do we integrate uh, newcomers, and how um, how does the uh, how does the the community go about it, and what kind of information do they need to know ahead of time instead of being put in front of a, um, an accomplished fact? I think that's where maybe the um, the, the um, how can I say the reluctance, mm -hmm. or relu uh, re uh, how that's why people get uh, reluctant at times. But I know the information is there. It's a, about, it's a matter of uh, uh, going after the information and going to the right sources. So I think it's a responsibility that uh, each person has, but as a community that we have. Uh, but I'm glad that we're talking about these things. Um, so we need to talk about these things. Tell me about your 
you used to work for Lutheran Social Services, right? Yes. Uh, how did, how, tell us about that and what you did. Well, you kind I... Of involved in the statewide... Yes. Yeah. I did... Um, I, I worked with... First of all, I came uh, through Lutheran Social mm -hmm. Services, so I had uh, a long history with uh, Lutheran Social Services. And I worked uh, with uh, that organization um, on and off in different capacities for 10 years, um, ranging from uh, my positions uh, or responsibilities ranged from uh, case management to initially resettled refugees uh, to providing interpretive uh, services uh, or cultural brokerage to um, overseeing the new American services while serving as a state refugee coordinator. So I was able to, um, to serve in uh, those capacities and also interact with uh, the stakeholders uh, that are involved in uh, refugee resettlement from, uh, let's say, landlords to uh, school administratives um, to uh, employers, uh, healthcare uh, systems, um, and, uh, and everybody in between, community members. And so I don't know exactly what you want me to tell nope, you. Nope, that's good. Yeah. Now you're involved with, you have Ubuntu Consulting, is yes. that correct? What is that? Well, uh, after I left Lutheran Social Services, um, I ventured uh, solo and starting my own consulting business. And uh, it's uh, mostly providing educational services in uh, the areas of uh, refugee immigrant issues, of course, but inclusion, diversity, and bridging uh, the cultural differences. Uh, so I do uh, provide support to both uh, mainstream communities and organizations uh, and to newcomers as well. So it's customized services. Uh, and sometimes I do also work uh, on uh, like a complex projects that uh, involve diversity or um, inclusion mindedness uh, um, somehow uh, or some some different uh, mm -hmm. in in different ways. You do a lot of speaking engagements as well. I do. What is your message, and who do you speak to? Um, most of the time, I speak at conferences, but I also speak at uh, universities, uh, uh, you know, high schools, uh, middle schools, even uh, in the, in the elementary schools. I do. Um, most of the time, it's. Uh, it, I also do speak at different. Uh, uh, like private groups, mm -hmm. like uh, I know tonight I'm going to be talking to uh, like a fundraisers, an organization of fundraisers uh, non for nonprofit in this area. There is an association uh, that I invited me uh, to uh, to share my message, and most of the so my message varies from the one group to another depending on what their need is, their needs are. Um, but uh, most, I, I'm usually asked to either share about my story of integration and what, uh, what barriers I had integrating and what can be done, um, what, things, uh, what, I, what is being done well and where, uh, what gaps can be closed. So that's usually uh, one of the areas that uh, service providers are interested in. Uh, sometimes I'm also asked to talk about um, a specific culture or specific um, challenges or opportunities for a new group in the community, let's say. Um, but that's also something that Lutheran Social Services does. Um, but if we have a new group, um, like a new, um, let's say, um, Congolese or you know, like Burundians. Mm -hmm. For a long time, my family was the only, only ones. Yeah, okay. yes. So when we, uh, when the community started receiving more Burundians, I was asked to educate the communities, the schools, the employers, and landlords, and anyone who was interested in in knowing how to prepare to um, to welcome or integrate uh, a specific group. Uh, and there are times also now, I guess, I'm also asked to talk about the book mm -hmm. and uh, what it is about and why I wrote it. And especially in uh, these uh, times where in the United States, in our community and in the world, uh, where we see so many divisive um, actions and also the rhetoric, I wanted to contribute to the dialogue by offering, uh, hopefully, tools uh, 
first of all, reminding people that uh, we are all part of uh, humankind, and I'm not minimizing the cultural mm -hmm. differences and, and the fear that uh, um, some people have when it comes to, um, to living or working or dealing with someone who is uh, from a different background. Um, but the message in this book is deeper. It's not just about immigrants. It's about really differences, handling differences uh, with a more open mind uh, and also uh, acknowledging the differences and, and committing to working or, or bridging the so-called or perceived differences. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's uh, th these days I'm, ask, I'm uh, uh, asked to talk about how can we do that and what kind of, uh, what tools are there, because I'm not the only person who would be, obviously, um, there are many tools. So basically it's like, where, where do we find the resources to do that? But there are many people who are not there yet. So uh, the tools are there, the resources are there, but there are many people who choose not to even talk about this, these uh, so-called differences. There are people who um, go from, uh, how can I say it, like a, I don't even want to deal with that, or if I'm going to deal with that, I know my stand, and I don't want to change. Right, right. And that's, that, I think that's a dangerous, uh, a dangerous place to be. A, a key part in the book, you talk about reclaiming yourself. What yes. does that mean for you? Uh, for me, uh, it was acknowledging that I grew up and lived in systems with uh, oppressive, mm -hmm. like a, internalize um, oppression, if I can say that, where you feel like maybe you don't, uh, you're not valued for the person and, uh, and the skill sets and, uh, and uh, the unique um, contributions that you bring into this world. So I grew up um, like in, uh, in cultures where you, f you, you know, if you're not from the right tribe mm -hmm. or the right part of the country or the right family, it's almost like a, automatically that you are undervalued as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I also grew up in a culture where women, in general, right. don't have much uh, of a say. And, uh, and, I, and, and to some extent, we, we, have, uh, we would not be talking about the glass ceiling if we didn't have, uh, um, or women's rights, if we didn't have uh, that kind of, uh, how can I say, issue to deal with, even in this country or in other Western societies. So reclaiming myself was truly um, knowing who I am, um, doing a intensive um, introspection and, uh, and, and finding my place. First of all, uh, understanding who I am, the unique gifts that I bring to this world, the kind of energy that I bring to you know, every setting where I am, and, and, uh, and knowing that um, circumstances, you know, good and bad, or um, people, or, or um, all the things that I went through uh, should not um, um, undervalue who I am as a person. And in uh, this book, I invite everyone, the reader, to, to do the same, to basically um, do a self-reflection and, 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 and a soul-searching to understand who you are, because when you know who you are, then you can decide uh, or can find what your role is in, uh, in uh, the community or even in the greater world. About a minute and a half left. What's the biggest misconception out there, do you think, that people have about refugees coming to Fargo or wherever? That refugees are a burden, mm -hmm. and that's uh, not true. Because um, you're ready to work and you're um, ready to pitch yes, you in and most, adjust, right? Absolutely, and ready to pay tax at the moment you start working. Mm -hmm. And actually, there are so many, um, a few studies that uh, highlight um, the contributions that refugees bring into the communities where they live, besides the obvious ones, like cultural, but like really the um, financial impact or um, you know, and, and beyond. So uh, it, I, I'm not sure where that came from. You know, yes, most of refugees, I'm, not, I'm going to say that almost everyone who is uh, coming here as a refugee will need 
a little bit of uh, help mm -hmm. uh, through social services and other um, the welfare system, but um, but it's most for my case it was less than two months. Yep. Last thing, if people want to get a hold of the book, read it, where can they go? How can they get it? Well, um, my website, LeticiaHelorud.com, okay. and um, yeah, you will get all you the can information buy it there. there. Okay. And, and uh, local bookstores like Sambros. Okay. And, yeah. All right. Thank you for being here. Good seeing you. Thank you. Leticia Mazzaro Hellerud. Her book is Being at Home in the World. Stay tuned for more. All careers begin somewhere, and Lawrence Welch started on the family homestead farm in South Central North Dakota. The original red barn stands not only as a marker for the farm, but as a monument to Welch's legacy. More than 20 years after his death, and 30 years after the last performance of the Lawrence Welch television program, the Lawrence Welch Show continues to be one of the most popular programs on public television. All legends begin somewhere. The Lawrence Welk legend and legacy began on the family's homestead farm in South Central North Dakota. One and two and... The Welk place is a unique but a very common Farmstead, as I've seen it in my lifetime. We drive down 83 and then there's a turnoff and it's a gravel road. Well, you drive down the gravel and then you have to take this pathway up to the farm. It's nestled in this little island right on Baumgartner Lake. First thing you see is the barn because it's red and it's the biggest building there. The Welk Barn is pretty much a typical prairie barn. It's not the Cadillac of barns, it's not a bad barn, it's kind of a typical barn. Friends, I think you'll enjoy this week's Lawrence Walk Show featuring some of the wonderful songs from the Broadway musicals. It's not a real big building, but uh, functional. It has a hay loft where you'd put some hay and in the winter time you'd have to feed the cattle, so that was a good place to have it and good place for the cats to have their kittens up there and things like that. <laughs> The Welk Homestead and then our activity in restoring the Welk Barn is important for several reasons. You know, we don't have any state historic site in this state that deals with homesteading and pioneer farming. What a statement in North Dakota, you know. Well, we need that. We have no state historic site that treats specifically the ethnocultural history of the Germans from Russia, our state's largest cultural group. Well, we need that. We don't have any state historic site in that whole South Central North Dakota area, for that matter. And we need that as kind of a linchpin in the historic landscape of German-Russian country there. Folks, here's a short preview of our show this week. A salute to our senior citizens. Most of the buildings are in very good shape. There will be some work done on the barn. There's a story to be told there, and I'd hate to lose that, that structure. So that is probably our biggest challenge. Uh, but we want to, you know, put it together so people can actually go in and see things. Fundamentally, the barn looked pretty good, but it had become unsafe. When we started going in to do the repair work on it, we found that there were some, there were some uh, joists that weren't tied to the studs, and oh, I began to get a little nervous at that point. So we took particular care as we were disassembling the loft decking, for instance. Only do a little bit at a time and put it back, you know. Let's keep this thing holding together while we're working on it. It's not unsafe anymore. At the State Historical Society, we have a unique responsibility, and that's uh, historic preservation. And we take that seriously. I mean, we preserve artifacts and items and pictures and people uh, that people have owned, but preservation of buildings and structures, which are important to understanding North Dakota, is, is one thing that we really focus on. And uh, Welk Homestead provides us with an opportunity to do that. Good night, sleep tight, and pleasant dreams.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. But as always, thanks for watching. Funding provided by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.